And the judgment, the sin is actually, I mean, it's fairly intense in this book too. I mean, look at, you know, passages like, where is that? Um, in chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, woe to those who scheme iniquity. This isn't someone who's just struggling and doggone it, there I went again. No, this is scheme iniquity who work out evil on their beds. Okay, they lay awake and plot and scheme and determine what their course of action is going to be and it's obviously against the Lord. So who work out evil on their beds, when morning comes they do it for it's in the power of their hands. They covet fields and then seize them and houses and take them away. They rob a man in his house, a man in his inheritance. I mean, there's a, a very determined, aggressive scheming to take people down. Okay, how, I mean, this would be obviously, at least in my mind, a, probably a richer person who's sitting around thinking, how can I expand my wealth regardless of what the outcome might be for another person. I mean, plotting, scheming, trapping. So yeah, it's, it's really right there in your face. But there is that hope trickled along the way. I mean, were you say, so what would you say? Was it heavy or were you able to hold on to that hope? Because you immediately went to the end of the book and said, yeah, well, okay. And one of the things that I noticed is that after you have this heavy section, there is this kind of salvation theme that comes out. And so yeah. I felt that it was pretty balanced. Um, in that sense, you'd have a large section that dealt with, um, you know, the corrupt leadership, things like that. But then, hey, God's going to bring about peaceful latter days and yeah. things are going to get better. So, yeah. Well, let's talk for a moment about how we might outline this and what our structure might be of this particular book. So look at what you have written down and let's just go for it for a little bit. AJ, you got yours all done? What is your main message? So God giving punishment to Judah? So God punishing Judah. All right. So God punishing Judah. All right. Marcella, do you want to add to that? How'd you say it? So you have the, the judgment and the restoration part of it. So we've got that right there, but also an emphasis there. Esther, what do you, what do you think? Yeah, I have similar. God will bring judgment on the sins of injustice, but he will not fail to establish his kingdom. Okay, so he will bring, would you say justice? So judgment on injustice, but then we've got that restoration with kingdom. So we have a, a kingdom focus there. Riley, anything you want to add to that? Um, I'd say it's, I found actually a, a lot more messianic reference, or at least what I thought were more messianic references. I think it's a lot more, not necessarily restoration, but eternal. Uh huh. Uh huh. So you put a strong focus there. You felt like there was this launching forward. And as we go through the prophets, this is true. I mean, when you go back before the prophets, what do you know about what's going to happen in the future? Okay, we, we, we begin to get a sense that this is going to fall apart, but it's in the prophets that Messiah kingdom really begins to get traction. Now, it's not that it's absent. Some people would go all the way back to Genesis 3.15. The seed of the woman is going to crush the head of the seed of the serpent. But then you have the end of Deuteronomy where Moses clearly says, you guys are all going to fall away. I mean, I can't imagine being Joshua at that point. You guys are just going to screw up big time. I'm going to die and Joshua take over. It's falling apart. But then it makes it very clear that God's going to grab you from all the places of the earth. He's going to bring you back together. So that's why people say the Pentateuch really is a miniature Old Testament that contains the entire message. And those last little bit 
those last little chapters of Deuteronomy then get expanded. And this is really what the rest of the Old Testament is about. They do fall away. Repeatedly they fall away and God continues to bring them back until ultimately there's a coming day when, as Riley was just saying, we've got this eternal kingdom focus that's there. Jane, would you add anything to the main message here? Judgment, destruction, restoration. So you got it all right there. Blaze, anything? Well, I'd say there's a little bit of a teaching element that the Lord gives, or just that, like Micah, the chapter 6, it's like, um, just what does the Lord require? It's an obvious one, but I feel like throughout there's little pieces of, like, this is what you should do, and it's very, like, uh, blatant versus you know, other minor prophets where it's, I don't know, it's not as blatant, I feel, like, as Micah. Yeah, so we, we do see what you're talking about in other passages. How do you build that into your, your main message, which is this call to return? Okay, what does the Lord require of you? Well, this is what He requires of you. So, you know, if you want to experience His blessing, then how is it you need to live? And, and so that's probably one of the most famous or well-known verses in this book. I mean, you got the be born in Bethlehem, obviously the strong messianic of that. But then after that, what does the Lord require of you? And it was a, I don't know, a zillion years ago when I did um, Spiritual Emphasis Week. Is that what it's called? Or what, what do you guys have? Do you guys have a spiritual? Tory conference? No, it wasn't even Tory conference. It was, a, it was in September because it, right in the middle, September 11th. It was 2001. That's when I did it. Wasn't that 9-11, 2001, 9-11? So whatever it was, they had the, what was called, a, so that was a long time ago, right? 2001. <laughs> Good grief. That's a zillion years ago. Were you guys born yet in 2000? No. It was 11 years ago, and so they, they had what they called a spiritual emphasis week, and I did Micah 6-8, because you've got the three components to that. It was a Monday, Wednesday, Friday chapel, and it was bizarre. The reason I remember it is because 9-11 happened right in the middle of it, and there was this quick, you know, congregating of people. What do we do now? <laughs> do we go on with business as usual? I mean, this is one of the most amazing things that's happened, not amazing, devastating things that's happened in America. And we just stuck with business as usual while we tried to regroup. If you guys remember that time, everybody was trying to regroup, trying to figure out what was the next step. So Micah 6, 8 was the passage I used there. So we've also got in here, not just judgment, not just the punishing, but that call to return in the midst of it all. Now, before we look at your notes and, and what it says there, let's back this up. Who did we begin with? Who gave us God punishing Judah? Where did we begin? Who? AJ, how did you, what were your major divisions of this book? Can you speak up so I can hear you? Wrath on Judah. Okay. What was that one? Rescuing Zion. Rescuing Zion. <clears throat> All right. Yeah, back to that wrath theme again. Seven, compassion and restoration. All right. So you almost have a cycle here, right? Wrath, rescue, wrath, rescue um, would be an idea if we just stuck that word rescue right in here. Again, you follow that? You've got something like that going on. All right, who else? Who wants to jump in there? Who did it different than this right here? Adam, is yours different? Yeah, I only had uh, three major divisions. Okay. I broke it up, uh, chapter 1, to uh, chapter 3, to uh, chapter 12. Okay. And chapter 12, I laid that as sin leads to judgment and warning for the restoration of the promise. Okay. So you actually have a promise of restoration in here somewhere. Yeah. All right. And then I broke uh, chapter 4 to 5.15, and I laid it back to the last day. And then 6.1 to 7.20, uh, it goes back to judgment. But there will be a day where they again will rise and proclaim the Lord to the other nations. 
So again, another promise of restoration there. What was your middle category here? The last days. days. Alright. What else we have? Who wants to jump in? Caroline. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> um, I did chapter one through two. Okay, one to two. And with that, I just um, wrote the coming destruction for us. So coming destruction. And then chapter three, I I separated them for denouncing the wicked rulers and prophets. All right. Right. And then seven, uh, one through seventeen, for the day of the Lord and the glorious future, um, for the resident of Judah. And then eighteen through twenty, I separated that because I noticed that was specific focus on hope being found in the Lord's character and All right. So hope in the Lord. Um, so here, destruction, more of a denouncing here that has just been pulled together with this wrath on Judah. And then we've got the deliverance that can be here. And both you and Adam pulled together four and five. Here we were separated, these two went together. Um, and then seven, we've got the rescue, glorious future, and what the Lord's gonna be doing. Um, because six is a part of this, we've got judgment with a promise of restoration. So you guys are grasping all the themes, it's just how you're pulling it together that is different. And so is, whatever the difficulty was that you were going through, you can see once you start hearing everybody else, you were getting it. It was just how do you separate this out? Because obviously um, when Mike is writing this, he's not you know, setting up some kind of outline and say, well, I think I'll talk about wrath first, then a little bit of restoration, then some more wrath and restoration. Um, these are um, sermons that have been put together with a certain theological focus that becomes important. So let's think for a moment about what we have in our notes and try to dive into this book just a little bit. You can see on your first page there that you have a little bit on the main message. And here's one right here. Israel's violation of covenant law and God's faithfulness to the Abrahamic covenant. Now notice in this main message, remember on the quiz we were talking about this prominent focus on the Abrahamic covenant, but I also bring in the fact that you can't hardly have a prophetic book without some focus on Mosaic covenant. So it's not that Mosaic covenant's not there, it's just that the, he brings a particular focus on this Abrahamic covenant, especially as looking towards the future. God is going to restore, God is going to be at work, God will be faithful to his people. And then you can see in that opening paragraph as well that he prophesies during the reigns of Jotham, Ahaz, Hezekiah, kings of Judah. So that goes back to 2 Kings 15 through 20. So you, again, you can go to 2 Kings 15 to 20 and then you can get a little bit of a 3D look at what's going on with the people back then by reading Micah. And you realize, wow, it wasn't good. This is really bad. Now we do see some times of prosperity here, God's blessing being poured out on the people. Um, we, we must, there must have been some kind of revival. And so we'll talk about all that in just a moment. But what do we know about the prophet Micah? Well, his name means who is like Yahweh. Um, he was a contemporary with Hosea and Isaiah as well as Amos. So you've got the northern and southern kingdom and you've got this focus as God tries to bring his message, calling people back. In fact, he is known as the Amos of the Southern Kingdom. That is why you feel the doom when you read this book. I mean, Amos is referred to oftentimes as the prophet of doom. Well, if Micah then is the Amos of the Southern Kingdom, that's why again you feel the weightiness for this. So for background information in our notes here, you can actually go back to Amos. If you remember the material on external prosperity that led to eternal, uh, internal decay, you had this situation which led to this, which led to this. That same 
framework of thinking that was taken, that we talked about in Amos, you can apply to the book of Micah as well. In other words, this is a, something that we see so often through scripture. God's blessing leads to forgetting. Everything going good, love and life, and then all of a sudden God gets squeezed out of the picture. We see this over and over and over in the Bible. And that's why all the way back in Deuteronomy chapter 8, Moses said, when you get into the land and you live in houses you did not build and you eat from crops you did not plant, don't you forget it's the Lord who brought you here. He gave you. And then it goes on and says, even in their future, he's the one who gives you power to make wealth. Do not forget that. And it's just a general tendency we have in the midst of celebration, God gets crowded out. Then in the midst of agony, God gets brought back in. And so we just see this throughout scripture. Amos, we saw it. And now Micah, we see the same thing. Here these people have this wealth. That passage I read earlier, chapter two, verses one and two. They have all these things and all this wealth. And what are they doing? Giving praise to the Lord and thinking about how they can use their wealth to resource others and bless others. No, they're laying on their bed, thinking about how they can take the next person down to add to their wealth. And there's something wrong with that. And, but we can do the same things in our life too if we're not careful. So there's a pattern here. Blessing brings forgetting that we have to hold on to. Now look also with, with Micah. He was a broken man. He fought for his people. And in some ways he's the contrast to contemporary prophets, especially when you have these false prophets <coughs> prophesying, hey, everything's good. Don't worry about it. So anytime you see a connection with chapter three in prophets, that's where God is really coming after the rulers. And so it's, it's, it's very negative at that point in time. We know a little bit about his background as well. Introductory comments. The message of this book is delivered before the fall of Israel. Okay, so that's why he's a contemporary with Hosea. You know, Hosea is the prophet to the northern kingdom. And so um, northern kingdom is still there. And even though no northern kingdom kings are mentioned, it's also a prophecy for the northern kingdom. Many references, Samaria, Jerusalem, that are there. Micah witnesses the events that bring about the destruction and deportion, deportin, de deportation of Israel. And so you just wonder, when the, when the southern kingdom watched all this stuff, why it didn't have much more of an effect on them. And so Mike is going to reference some of that. Now, some doubt he ever prophesies Samaria, and they hold to a view that understands any references to Samaria to be inserted by a later redactor. I insert that comment, and every now and then you see me insert comments like this. Listen, when you get into Old Testament studies, there is so much stuff out there. It, they're always wanting to take apart the text. And, and so just throw that out there. You will run into that kind of stuff in commentaries. Um, look at point B, Micah and his prophecies play an important role in the reforms of Judah. It's always good, I think, when we can see a prophet that's having a positive effect. And so when you look at Jeremiah 26, verses 18 and 19, Jeremiah references Micah as a prophet during this particular time period. And then when you get back to 2 Kings 18, 1 through 6, you see that underneath Hezekiah, there was an incredible reform that took place, especially when you go to the books of First Second Chronicles. Anytime there's a reform in the nation of Israel and you read about that in Kings, Chronicles oftentimes expands that a little bit because Chronicles is focused on proper worship of the Lord. So you go to Chronicles and there's a whole lot more said about Hezekiah there. But um, it's, it could be very possible that Micah is one that had an impact here. Um, that one-to-one -one correspondence isn't made there. Then Micah also utilizes the same courtroom terminology as Amos in chapter one, verse two, hear, O peoples, listen, O earth. And so the Lord God, and, and, and let the Lord God be a witness against you, the Lord from his holy temple. Then also in chapter six, picks up the same thing. The Lord has a case, or here it says, arise, plead your case before the mountains. And so, you know, again, creation is being called as witness um, so oftentimes that we see um, in the prophets. Now, background issues. During this time period of this prophecy, the land was extremely prosperous. And again, this is because of the military successes of King Uzziah or Azariah. 
but the people had not given their hearts to Yahweh. The successes brought about the development of the merchant class, and these brought about divisions in society. And so the agrarians were often oppressed. So what you have here, let's, let's just call these circles right here your agrarians. And don't you love that word, agrarians? Okay, so these are our agrarians here. These are your basic farmers who are out there. They're working hard. Um, but what happens is uh, because of trade routes that are being established, because um, Israel becomes much more of a major player in the world. We talked about this with, um, I can't remember which book exactly. Um, trade routes get established. This begins to create this, this, uh, these levels of society where if you wanted to make money, on your crops, then you had to have access to the trade route. So what happens is we, we have the creation of the, you know, what we might call today the middleman. And so the middleman is the one then who collects all of these crops. And this is the merchant class that your notes are talking about right there, the merchant class. And so what happens is because the, the merchant or the middleman is now the one who holds the power, holds control of how goods are sold, it actually drives the price down for these guys right here. But once he has control of the goods, he can take that out and he can make as much money as he wants. These guys right here become dependent on this guy in order to trade their goods and sell them on the market. And so this guy right here, he has all control. He can say, well, I'm not going to buy yours unless you'll sell it to me for this amount right here. And so this guy wants his crop sold, so he'll sell it for maybe a little bit cheaper. And you see how that begins to drive the, the price down because they all want their crop sold. This guy gathers it all, but then he gets out there on the open market and then he can get whatever he wants to with it. And that's why you, you little by little have this merchant class, these rich people. And then the rich people, they are scheming in devising how they can make even more money. And so this group right here gets further oppressed while these right here get more and more wealth added to their little portfolio. And so that's some of the issues that you're talking about. Now, when what we read in the prophet, it doesn't explain all this to us. It just talks about the oppression, the injustice that's taking place. And so scholars that actually do the background work, they're the ones that dive into this and look at other documents, begin to figure out, oh, this is what was going on during that time. So trade routes become a really important part of this. And eventually what happens is the merchants buy up the land. So now they actually own the land and the workers are now in, in some sense enslaved to them and they're just amassing more and more wealth and they're just squeezing that away from other people. And so they lose money down here and they drive the price up up here. And it just becomes a difficult and ugly situation. Now, you see that some of the issues of the people um, that could easily be referenced as we work our way through this, there, you see just a, a grocery list of items here. But let me, let me put some of these down here for you. What do we got here? Five. So the idolatry that was even referenced, we did our quiz. You know, you got to have credit for that because, you know, we've, we've got that emphasis throughout the book. But we've got these five different types right here. Um, the mistreatment of fellow community members. Again, what we were just talking about with the merchant class, the agrarian class, that's a part of that. The misconduct of the prophets, even when you get to chapter three, really all of leadership. Uh, within the nation of Judah at that point. Inappropriate leadership, this is what you really have being driven in chapter three specifically. The idolatry throughout as well. Um, we've got, you know, the passage I have here is one seven, the idols will be smashed, okay? Images, I will make desolate. And so there is a reference to this. And then also the rejection of the prophetic message. And this becomes really important um, because what is God doing when he sends his prophet? He, in his mercy, is calling the people back to covenant obedience and faithfulness. Why? So that he can bless them. And so when the prophetic message gets rejected, then that's just enabling the nation to continue to spiral down. And again, now you know what this is like to hear a message 
and then you weigh it. Because even today, if someone has the, the gift of teaching and of speaking truth into your life, um, I mean, ultimately, that's the Lord. When that, when that gift is being exercised in the power of the Holy Spirit, that's the Lord who is speaking at that moment. And you know what it's like to sit there and go, eh, I don't really like that. Well, I do like that. You know, and you just weigh it, you evaluate, you, you evaluate it, right? Well, that's the same thing that's going on here. How do you find someone to follow? How do you find a truth speaker so that when you listen, it's as if it came from the Lord? And when you have so many voices out there, I mean, it, it can get a little scary and, and you end up becoming someone who just weighs. Well, that's what they were doing too. They were just weighing. They weren't receiving that message and saying, thus saith the Lord. They were weighing it. Nah, that's, that's, that's okay for you. That's true for you, but it's not true for me. I'm listening to this voice over here. And so we have a lot of voices out there today. There was a few years back when I was at Spirit West Coast, um, up north, the northern Spirit West Coast, and this guy was standing up, and he's got all these young people just, oh, you're the best, you're awesome. And he's got this audience, and he starts speaking. And little by little, he's, you know, talking generalities about the Bible. And then all of a sudden, he starts saying things like, well, you know, I haven't even thought about this, but I'm going to say it anyway. And he's, they're just, oh, you're the best. He just keeps on talking. And I'm sitting there like, no. No, please, just stop it. You need to think about what you're saying. That's not a good idea. Um, th that's a voice, right? And they're just taking it all in. And I really, I, I mean, I spent days trying to track down his email address. I wanted to contact him. I went on his website and tried to contact him and it wasn't working. I just wanted to say, listen here, <laughs> let me give you some advice. Read the book of James especially where it talks about, not all of you should be teachers. <laughs> I just want to warn you. There's a stricter judgment when you say, I haven't thought about this, but I'm going to say it anyway. Well, there's a lot of voices out there, and we've got to be careful what we're listening to. They had a lot of voices too. Look at this, the misconduct of the prophets. There's a lot of voices out there. And so it, you can't just throw it all away and make yourself the ultimate judge of all of this. You've got to find the voices that you're going to listen to, and you've got to find the voices that you're going to submit to. And the, the nation wasn't doing that, and because, again, they had a lot of noise that was taking place there. Now look at point C. Micah prophesies during the reigns of three kings mentioned in his book, and I men mentioned them there. You know, exactly where does this prophecy fit? Well, you know, you got Jotham, that's before the fall of Samaria, capital of the northern kingdom. You got Ahaz, there's a lot of indictments of social and religious corruptions that fit well within his time. And then also Hezekiah, Mike also fits well with the pre-reformation of Hezekiah. So, you know, exactly what point in time was he, was the focus of his prophecy? That just gives you just a brief summary of where he might fit. But somewhere between 750 BC up to 686 BC. Now, the structure of Micah, this is what we were talking about um, earlier with the work that you had done. And you can see one way to look at it, a general outline would be a superscription, a first oracle in chapters one and two, and then a second oracle. Now, notice these have the judgment, restoration, second oracle, indictment, but also future hope, third oracle, the lawsuit, ultimate triumph. So earlier, you know, the screen's in the way right now, but when I was talking about, was it AJ that you had the, the wrath and some kind of rescue and then more wrath and some kind of rescue? Well, that really is a little bit of the cadence throughout. And you also saw that in all the other structures that we were talking about. You know, yeah, it's this, but then a little bit of restoration and oh yeah, restoration's here. And, and so oftentimes the way the scholars will look at it is with these three different oracles. And in the same way that Caroline wanted to separate out chapter 7 verses 18 through 20, you see in this last one right here um, a little bit of a separation, not just of 18 through 20, but going all the way back to verse 11 through 20. Um, and oftentimes scholars want to put a little bit out there because that is where, I think Jeff, that's what you were talking about earlier when you were talking about just this, this blessing that's at the end. So as bad as Micah might be, there's this movement towards this blessing that is out there. All right, let's look and see what else we got here in your notes. You can see the message of Micah. 
Um, just a bunch of mini, seri- mini sermons, um, result of deep emotional involvement in his nation's plight way back in the introductory material. We were talking about how the prophet really, they feel, they experience what's going on in the nation. Mike is a good example of that. If you just look down beneath his words a little bit, you can see a man who is torn and conflicted and really desires something to take place within the the lives of the people. Um, The purpose is found there in chapter 3 and verse 8 where it says this, On the other hand, I am filled with power, with the Spirit of the Lord, with justice and courage to make known to Jacob his rebellious act even to Israel, his sin. So in the midst of all these voices that were out there, Micah stood forward very clearly, knew he had a calling, knew he had an anointing, and knew that he had something to proclaim. And so he he just really moved forward with that kind of purpose in mind. Now point B, again, the book, again, think about structure divided into three sections, indictment, salvation, indictment, salvation, indictment, salvation. So you can look at that. Each of the indictments, look how it begins with the word hear or listen up. And so that provides a little bit of structure to the book as well, that you have this this cry to listen up. Now, John Walton, I wanted to get to this. Um, Let's see, we, we went through all of these already. I wanted to get to what John Walton said. He's got five foci, foci, Esther, how do you say that? I never, focuses would be good for me. Um, We've got five different items of focus for the judgment oracles. And so he he develops these right here. And as we look at, you know, number, I mean, point B there, we were talking about indictment and judgment. Um, Up earlier when we were talking about the structure, we were talking about the three oracles that are there. Well, within the three oracles that are there, this seems to be the focus in what John Walton pulls out. John Walton, he's a great scholar. He's up at um, Wheaton Graduate School right now working with Old Testament there. Was at Moody Bible Institute for years. Um, But destruction of cult places and objects using cult terms. So especially, we've already looked at this passage in chapter 1, but then you you see more reference of that in chapter 3, verse 12. So when you go back to the history especially when you look at Hezekiah's day, that's one of the major um, transformations that took place in the culture at that time was they got rid of all the cultic high places. Um, Number two here, political devastation, including the overthrow of cities and sending their inhabitants into exile. And so again, in chapter one, there's a focus here. There's something that's going to be coming and they've got to be very careful about what happens um, in the future. Um, Number three, personal judgment against specific offenders. And so earlier, even when I was reading chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, those who are scheming on their beds, well, boom, right out of that comes some personal judgment. Very specific offenders being referenced there. Um, Probably this merchant class that we were talking about, the middleman over here. And then number four, spiritual judgment depriving the prophets of revelation. Now, this is a very interesting um, passage that we haven't looked at yet. We've talked about chapter 3 being against the rulers, but in the midst of the prophets being inaccurate and just really self-deceived and self-serving, it says, therefore, it will be a night for you without vision and darkness for you without divination. The sun will go down on the prophets and the day will become dark over them. The seers will be ashamed. The diviners will be embarrassed. Indeed, they will all cover their mouths because there's no answer from God. Now, ultimately, that doesn't stop false prophets because this is going to create money for them. And so they'll, they'll create their own vision as far as that goes. But there's spiritual judgment. And then finally, socioeconomic judgment affecting the fertility of the land. And so again, when we go back to Deuteronomy chapter 28, Leviticus 26, because they were agrarian society, you often see the land being affected by judgment from God. So that's what John Walton focuses on when he thinks about those oracles. Um, When you look at your major topics and you think, and and you do the sins of the people, and if you were to highlight 
the judgment, 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 the three oracles of judgment. And if you looked at your major topics and you highlighted sin and you saw where there was an emphasis in each one of those, you could actually add to this list or create your own. Now he's just talking broadly, but you might even see sins that were um, repeated throughout the book. The two foci of salvation we find in the book is both short term and indefinite. There will be deliverance from the Assyrians and there will be the restoration of the nation. Now, as Riley was saying earlier, um, the deliverance that seems to be in this book seems to be big. It seems to be eternal. It seems to be something that is way out there. Um, but again, you have to start with the immediate future or the uh, contemporary situation, the immediate future. And then if the text keeps on pushing you, then you allow it to take you all the way out as far as it needs to go. But short term, there's going to be some deliverance from the Assyrians. Remember, the Assyrians are the ones coming down and they're going to take out the northern kingdom. The southern kingdom is going to be spared for a little bit of time because of revivals like maybe Micah was able to stir up, for instance, in the days of Hezekiah, whatever it might have been. So the southern kingdom is going to be given a little bit longer history, so they're going to be delivered. Um, but then something is going to happen for them as well. And then ultimately there's going to be the restoration of the nation. Now, point D, the message is like Amos. Like Amos is presented as a lawsuit. So God has witnessed the heavens and the earth. The creation is there. And he's also bringing forth his lawsuit. So witness and, and prosecutor at this point. And Micah 6, 1 to 8 is probably the most well-known passage. And what's significant about this passage is it reveals the heart of Yahweh as well as the heart of the prophetic message. It removes any notions that the Mosaic law was to produce legalism. And so this is something I, I just love to continue to push forth in teaching the Old Testament because just because the Pharisees made the law all about legalism, it does not mean that that was the thrust of the law. Now, it was a law that was written on stone, so it did not transform the heart, just like the law written on the heart will be in the new covenant, but it was to be transforming. Love for God, gratitude for all that he had done was to be the motivation for this, not look at me, look how good I am, look, I obeyed the law, now God owes me something. It's no, I owe everything to God. And so that's why the Exodus was constantly to be that hallmark event for the nation of Israel so that they would see um, what God had done for them. Now, in that last little section of your notes, you have some key theological themes. And notice on page 95, I actually develop a little bit for you um, the theological concept that we had on our quiz that Chisholm develops a little bit, the remnant idea. And this is something that really you can develop throughout the Bible. Um, God is constantly with a remnant. I mean, even Abram was a remnant. Here you got this entire world um, that's going against the Lord. And what does God do? He sets his affection on Abram and enters into a covenant with him. God's going to do something, you know, even though, even though the people are not following after him. And so there's a number of other things that we could look at and do. Um, it's getting to the end of our time that I have for today. But before we end up, I, I want to see how did you apply this book to your life? What did you have for application for you? Zach, you got some application? Yeah. <clears throat> and even take it one more step with chapter three, really misrepresenting God too. Um, that kind of deceit as well. Um, they were not representing the Lord in what they were seeking to communicate. It was all self-serving uh, for themselves. Other application. 
did you come up with? Jeff, you got one? God's past actions are for our instruction. And uh, right before that passage in uh, 6 8, God recalls how he brought them out of, out of Egypt as slaves. He provided them charismatic leaders, and that it says that he did all of this to reveal his righteous actions. Um, and so as we look back on God's past work in our lives, it gives us confidence for how he's going to deal with us in the present and in the future. Okay, so right, that was right in chapter 6, where God looks back at the Exodus. This is the hallmark event. And really, the, what you're referencing there is in the Old Testament, it's not just history in the sense of, okay, here's a bunch of events that took place. It's always history as theology. It's always history to teach, to instruct. And so the way that these books are written, all of them, the history that we have here is always intended to instruct us and to teach us and point us toward the Lord. And then we have our own history, right? And so we can so easily forget what God has already done for us as we go to the future. And that's why you have to find a way to create remembrances. And so this is a big issue throughout the Old Testament. You know, they would have these remembrances. The problem is they would forget, even though they had the remembrances. And so just like they had the Exodus that was constantly to be there for them, the cross, Jesus' death, burial, resurrection is our primary remembrance, the observance of the Lord's Supper is something we've got to remember. It's the gospel front and center always in our lives. I mean, your life may be falling apart, but you've got to hold on to the gospel in the midst of all that. Um, there was a, I went to Starbucks this morning and there was, there's a former student that was there. He didn't have enough money to stay at Biola, but all I did was ask him how he was doing and man, and just, just tears started coming down. I mean, this guy was so shook up. Um, and when he handed me my little, what do they call it, little splash, you know, thing, so your coffee doesn't splash out. I mean, it was just like this. And I, I you know, I said, you want to talk? He goes, it's a long story. And just shaking. You know, what, what does he have to hold on to at that point? I mean, if nothing else, he's got the gospel to hold on to. And it just, it's got to become a central thing for us. But then there's going to be other things that you're going to add to that as you go through life when God meets you in very powerful ways. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.